It's my pleasure to bring him in, Ryan Rossillo of The Ringer and the Ryan Rossillo Podcast. Ryan, thanks for joining us on a uh, pretty busy day out here in the NBA for Golden State fans. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a fun start to the off season. So, um, you know, it was crazy because we had Chris Paul live on the show, <laughs> and I didn't know if he was going to make it because he had been traded once. And uh, by the time I left New York, he was traded again. So during the pod, he was still a wizard, or at that point, had he become a Golden State Warrior? And what do you think of the the travels of Chris Paul and where he wound up? Yeah, he was a, he was still a wizard then, and uh, I got the sense after that night that he wasn't going to be a wizard very long, and uh, that was a good guess. So, look, I mean, I've, I've been a huge fan of his. Uh, I I think a lot of times, like the way we talk about coaches in a lot of sports, you know, if you don't win, we think you're a bad coach, and if you win, we think you're a great coach. And I've just always believed that I, there's these categories, these lanes with players and coaches where you know you can be everything you'd want a player, everything you'd want a coach, and it just doesn't work out. And for Paul it's been injuries in the playoffs more than anything else. I think it's been clearly one of the best point guards of his generation, but he's 38. There was a decline this year and, you know, they made a move that makes a lot of sense on the assets going out for an asset like Bradley Beal. I mean, the contract itself is a whole nother conversation and how well he'll fit in with them. But my favorite thing about Chris Paul is, is not just the competitive stuff and that every team, once he shows up there, there's a pretty massive jump in wins. It's just that I think he's, he's incredibly smart. And, you know, his playing style is probably the opposite of what Golden State's been doing. You know, Golden State, my favorite thing about it is that everybody moves, everybody's thinking about somebody else. They play to the end of the shot clock. I mean, it's just beautiful basketball. I think that's why we've all been in love with this this group for this run. But with Paul in the mix, uh, if he were in his prime, <laughs> I'd probably go, wait, I'm not sure about the fit. But I think at this stage he realizes that, um, you know, he's going to have to adapt to them. And he's, you know, I still think the shooting is probably going to come back a little bit just because of the gravity of the other shooters on this team. So, you know, I'd expect it, despite the declining numbers, to jump back up there a bit. Maybe he runs the second unit. When he was with Harden, they staggered them quite a bit, but they still closed together, so he had to learn how to play off of him. I just think he's really smart. And at this stage of his career, and maybe trying to prove himself on what would be a new deal after this year, um, you know, I, I just I just like him, the player, even if the basketball fit isn't the typical fit that we see with Warriors players. Yeah, I mean, I, I love him as a mid range sniper too, and especially with the clock, uh, shot clock rolling down, uh, he can handle that pressure. Who do you, I mean? He's a guy that makes other people better, and you mentioned the you know the Warriors. They it's you know a lot of body movement, a lot of ball movement. Um, do you think he's a guy that potentially can make and you know, bring out some of the traits in Jonathan Kuminga that? We haven't seen yet. Maybe I, you know I don't know. I mean, it's been obviously. I don't need to explain it to you guys how frustrating it's been with the lottery picks not panning out. And you know, the funny thing is, is that I thought, hey, Wiseman's life is going to be really easy. Just rim runs, and like guys are going to be ignoring you. And the same thing for Kaminga when when Clay and Steph were in. Grand, and I know Kaminga's minutes weren't always aligned with those guys, but you would have thought. It, it's a really easy role to be the fourth or fifth option out there, and it just hasn't happened. I think the best part of Kaminga's game is when it seems like he gets the defensive assignment of like a really big time, like a higher profile player. Uh, it seems like he gets up for that challenge, which you know still gives you some hope that there's something in there. Uh, you know, the Aiton thing is is funny because I think I think there was some real frustration with Aiton from Chris Paul when he first got there, um, and yet. You know, the Monty Aiton disconnect was so bad that it almost kind of sabotaged it for the season coming off the end of last year, the loss to Dallas. And then you were hearing stuff that basically said that, like, Chris Paul not being there for Aiton is actually bad for Aiton, which, you know, really is the full scope of uh, telling a story between those two guys. So, you know, I, I think the gr- as great as Steph and Clay are, I think the, the fear would always be like, what would this team's personality be like if Draymond Green ever went somewhere else? Like, I don't know that you can always have all passive personalities as great as it's been. Like, you know, I'm not even sitting here criticizing it, but I think you always need kind of one of those alphas, somebody that's going to get somebody's face every now and then. I think every team needs at least one of them. And I think Chris Paul is a guy that, that gives you two if Draymond's still in the fold. Ryan Rossillo from the Ryan Rossillo podcast and the ringer here on Willard and Dibbs. Larry in for Mark on 95 70 game. If you have the two alphas, if Draymond resigns and the expectation around here is that. They're going to get that done. Can Chris Paul and Draymond Green get along over the course of 82 with both being aggressive alphas? 
Yeah, I think for a year or two, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think those guys, I think they'll see something in each other, you know. I think they'll see something in each other where they're going to they're gonna be excited about it, you know. I really do. And, look, Draymond, for whatever the bad version of it is that we, we've all experienced, and, you know, at times it can be a little tough. You're just like, okay, but he's still one of the smartest players in the league. He knows what he's supposed to be doing every time. He knows the assignments. He knows all that stuff. He's not going to make those mistakes. And, like, that's the stuff that Chris Paul gets frustrated with. Like, he's going to a graduate course group of good basketball guys between Kerr and the main characters on this team, you know. And uh, that may be why Poole is somewhere else because it just is, as much as the run was really impressive for him last year, the mistakes last – or, excuse me, two seasons ago when they won it all. But last year the mistakes were just so maddening at times. So – I don't really think that that's um, any anything that I'd worry about where you're like, oh, they're going to clash because they both have these really like chesty personalities. I, I think they're going to appreciate each other as competitors. Uh, do you think Green's back? And, and if that is uh, the situation, you know, where do you see Golden State in relation to Denver? Well, uh, you know, my guess is that, you know, again, it's a guess right now. Uh, my guess would be he comes back. You know, I, I, I think this group, you know, for everything they've been through together, it's just so rare in today's world of sports where you, where you have a group that's been together this long. And, you know, the Sacramento moves, you wonder, like, would they really, would they really do this to feel like they took a big swipe at Golden State? You know, it's more of a rival for Sacramento than it is for Golden State. They feel like they've made some kind of statement. I also think there's a basketball question about having Draymond and Sabonis on the floor at the same time in the playoff series. Uh, unless you think Sabonis lack of any kind of range is because of the, hand injury, which is a fair point, but, um, you know, if the money's close, this group coming back as that's been the answer in the relation to Denver, like the job of Mike Dunleavy or Myers before him or any of the 30 GMs in the league, like your job is to have a chance. Okay. And I know that seems like I'm being a little too easy on the, on the grading of it and how hard the job is, but really like even Phoenix, I may not love all of it, but you know, going into next year, they have a chance. And that Golden State group is going to have a chance. And, you know, for Denver to go on this run, it was really impressive with the playoffs. They figured out some stuff defensively. I guess I feel like I'm, I'm by myself on this one because they were so impressive during the playoffs. But, you know, it's still a 50-win team. They, they didn't win on the road. Their defense was average during the regular season. And I'm like, wait, now I'm supposed to expect that they're just going to run off like three or four titles? Like, that doesn't really happen in this league. Like, you have to be one of the all-time great teams. And I think it was also a really year, uh, weird year in the West. And you can go through it, whether it's the Clippers' problems, Phoenix trying to figure it out on the fly too late, you know, Durant getting hurt as soon as he got there, so they didn't really feel like they had anything rolling. They didn't know their rotations. Um, the Lakers kind of reinvented themselves on the fly. Sacramento, or Sacramento ends up being a two-seed. You've got Memphis and all the nonsense there. <laughs> so when you run through the West, like Denver was a survivor, and they were the only, like, stable thing. I mean, Sacramento was pretty stable, but it felt too new. We knew the defense wasn't good enough. So I'm not telling you like, hey, right now at the end of June, they're my pick to win the West, but they have a real chance. And at this point, I think that's all you can ask of a front office. Ryan Rosillo from the Ryan Rosillo podcast here on 95.7 The Game. I was thinking the same thing, Ryan, in terms of if this group is all together and healthy come April, they're going to be a tough out. But what if, worst-case scenario, Draymond does choose Sacramento? Where does that leave the Chris Paul edition and the state of this Warriors culture? Well, that'll, uh, I mean, you know, look, that would be that would be a huge loss. It, it just would. I mean, I know he's not a perfect player. I'd argue even at times, I just, you know, I asked him about this years ago. I think it was the Toronto All-Star weekend, and it you know, still was a little removed from the, you know, they had won, but... I still brought up 16 and I just said, you know, do you ever have any moments where you feel like I got to dial this back a little bit? And there's times where I'm watching, I'm like, you just want, you just want to get a technical right now. <laughs> like, I feel like this is a selfish thing. You just want to be heard. And I mean, hell, if he were any other player, he'd get technicals immediately. They give him a pretty, pretty long leash on that. So I, <laughs> I just, I think he does so many things for them defensively. Like he was actually like off the charts defensively as a player. If you look at some of the stats and the fact that you can't replace him because they have all the other salaries, you know, which we can lose sight of at times. Like just because he left for 30 million, you don't have to go spend on somebody else. Um, they just, they just would not be the same team. They still be good, 
but you know he just does so many things like in the margins for them. I, I, I would, it, I would to me it would it would drastically change my outlook for him. I always love hearing your thoughts on the the college players. Trace Jackson Davis at fifty seven and Pajemski at nineteen. Um, what what do they add? Give us your your thoughts on uh, what they contribute, maybe right away and maybe down the road. Pajemski's something else, man. He's like, I was at the combine. I hadn't done all my work on him, and I was sitting with a scout from another team, and one of his games started, and he was like, "Watch this dude." And, you know, we're all visual with the way we, we look at things, and you're kind of like him. Like, I'm supposed to look at him? And he's like, look, he's Mr. Wisconsin. He goes to Illinois. It doesn't work out. He goes to Santa Clara. He puts up massive numbers. So I went back and did the work on him. The shot-making stuff, like, he's a perfect warrior. <laughs> I don't know how often Steve Kerr is going to give him the green light, maybe with a second unit if he breaks the rotation. Because that's the other thing we always have to remind ourselves, too, of, like, you know, the late first and on picks, especially on a good team that's thinking championship. I mean, hell, like, we'll go back to it. The lottery picks had a hard time even cracking the rotation. So for Pajemski to do it, that would be a huge win itself. But back to his game, like, he will jimmer for dead. He'll just straight up pull up in transition off the dribble. And you're watching it going like, oh, my God, I don't even think that's a good shot. But then you look at the numbers and you go, this goes in. This goes in a lot. And the craziest thing about him, whether he plays on the ball off the ball, he's in constant movement, he's a massive competitor, and his rebounding numbers are crazy. He had two games this year where he had 18 rebounds. Look at his rebounding numbers. Go back to high school. He's like 10 a game for his career. So he's this dude with all this athleticism who, you know, look, is probably a smaller two-guard in today's NBA, but there's a, just a lot of juice to him. There's just a lot there where it makes sense. You had heard the rumors that Pajemski was kind of aligned with Golden State. You didn't know whether or not it was true or not, but it was one of the more uh, prominent rumors before the draft. And when you watch, go back and watch it at, at, at Santa Clara, you're like, okay, this makes a lot of sense. Trace, you know, he's, he's a really talented guy for a position that nobody cares about anymore. And that's the problem. That's why I went as late as he did. I know Dunleavy said he had him as the first rounder on the board. I know there's a relationship there. So, you know, good for him. They certainly could use the front line depth, but I still think it'd be a lot to ask of him to be in a playoff game playing major minutes when, you know, some other guys with probably better resumes couldn't even get off the bench. Ryan Rossillo from the Ryan Rossillo podcast here on 95 7 The Game. With Chris Paul coming in, it means Jordan Poole is going out. And you look back now at the Jordan Poole tenure here with Golden State. How would you summarize it? Well, I, I still think it's like a B because, I mean, he was really one of the most important scorers during the playoffs run two years ago. Uh, and I remember, I, you know, as you guys probably would, like, they pick him. And you're like, oh, yeah, that guy, you know. <laughs> and then you start watching him. And you're like, man, he is so good at getting to the rim. And then you're like, I wonder how good this guy's going to be. And he just got better and better and better. And you're like, this guy's a, a, a like a real dude. And then, you know, the contract stuff comes up and the teams that can afford it that have you know, ownership like the Lake Ups are like, you know, we're all in. It's all you could ask for there. And you go, look, I know it's a super, super expensive price tag on somebody um, considering all the other guys are paying, but you don't want to lose the asset for nothing. I mean, it goes back to the KD sign and trade for D'Angelo Russell. D'Angelo Russell didn't fit what they were trying to do, but it provided him an asset to do something later on. So I think that was part of it. But then last year was just like, I don't know if it was the Draymond punch I know it's really easy to say that that's the reason everything kind of fell apart when it did. Uh, I don't know. I'm not around the team every day, but I still feel like, you know, eventually you got to get out there and play. And that had been months prior. I don't think it's why they lost the Lakers. I think they lost the Lakers because they didn't have enough depth up front. But his mistakes were just, like, massive. Like, I think about the Minnesota regular season game with the turnover late. It just... There just felt like there was a lot of stuff where it's like it's one thing to be aggressive and, and have a turnover, but it's another thing to have it like the worst possible time. And I just felt like he had too many of those. And then when you start looking at the tax bill, if they keep Draymond and how ridiculous the second apron can become here, you know, once all that stuff kicks in, um, you know, it it obviously factors into all of it for a guy that felt like he really regressed. And I don't know that Kurt felt like he could trust him as much as he needed to. And then the Paul part of it, you know, maybe even like with Wiggins, when when they brought over Wiggins, you were like, okay, and it ended up being, you know, a big part of what they did two years ago, but you still felt like this is a tradable piece. So as much as I'm excited to see how the Chris Paul thing plays out, I also think there's a lesson in there that they kept the salary slot 
instead of just dump and pool into cap space for a trade exception where the league barely uses them anyway. Um, it, you know, it, it just, when you start doing the math, it just gets so insane on what they were going to end up paying in penalties that I think replacing the, the years remaining with the freedom to figure out what they want to do with their own guys or if they wanted to move some of the, you know, got options four or five later before the deadline, it just gives them more flexibility that they need it. Hey Ryan, how about a thought on Clay? I mean, one of the, one of the great two way players of his era, and he struggled down the stretch in the playoffs against the Lakers. Uh, how do you think he handles the twilight of his career? Well, shooting usually ages really well. Um, you know, the defense clearly took a step back, but you know, I think when you're when you have that bad of a playoff run, it becomes who you are, no matter what you did. And you know, there were times at the beginning of the year where you were like, man. No, I, I just, it doesn't look as good as we all want it to look, but these are like devastating injuries and to miss all that time. But then you put together those two, two months where I think Steph was out for a stretch of it too. Like he went off. I, I don't, I'm, I'm saying this off the top of my head, so I don't, don't quote me on it, but I, I think it was something like the most, like the most points he had scored in back to back months or something like that, like any stretch in his career. So I feel like that's a really important part of like what the expectation is for Clay going into next year because the way guys are talking about him now, look, he couldn't hit a shot there at the end, but I just refuse to believe all of a sudden he's not still going to make shots and not still be somebody that defenses have to respect that opens up stuff for other guys. So, you know, shooting, like I said, it does age well. He was never somebody that was going to just sit there and back you up and try to get by you. Dribble, dribble, dribble is just not who he is. Just keep moving, keep cutting. Guys are going to freak out and jump to Steph even when he's not the option and I think Clay will likely make more shots than what was a disastrous playoff series. A couple more minutes with Ryan Rosillo. We really appreciate your time here on 95.7 The Game. The Warriors are going to have to round out their roster late in free agency with veteran minimum players. Who do you think that might be available in the vet men market? We're all thirsty for vet men's out here, Ryan, with this salary situation. But who might fit and who might be available for the Warriors? Yeah, well, you're going to have to give me homework on that kind of question. Um, <laughs> I, you know, look. To sit here and start guessing names is pointless um, for me. I, I know it's it's a little bit more fun, um, but you know this this new CBA. I think is like the the upper class is always going to be taken care of. Um, the middle class may feel like they're going to have to take one more swing at it, so it could dilute the minimum market. Uh, Unlike the other times, you know, like even Jens is a really good example. Like that deal can't right. happen in the new form of things. Like the Danilo stuff that Boston did wouldn't happen. Like when you start looking at how the new rules are going to impact this stuff. So I'm just giving you instead of names, just an approach to like there may be guys willing to go to teams that aren't that good, feeling like I got to get some kind of two year deal now, as opposed to like let me go to Golden State or another team ring chase for a million and a half right. and then go back to market after I've proven myself. So instead of giving you names, I would I would tell you like I'd have to see it all sort itself out and see who's still left. But I I feel like that minimum stuff where you're like, I can't believe we got this guy for like nothing. Well there was a reason because he felt like he could make money if he had proved himself as as a real contributor to a playoff run. And I, I don't know, again, it's a guess, but looking at how restrictive this stuff could be, I don't see how any of those players are going to be doing anybody a favor financially, knowing that that whole market may be a lot different coming up here soon. You know, and obviously there's some different age guys, and I'm, I'd love to see the Warriors get a couple more players in their prime. Kerr took a lot of criticism out here in the Bay, Ryan, for not bringing along younger players, but I kind of push back on it, just feeling that the Warriors players were so young that I don't know that I would put that on Kerr. Give me your thoughts on on Steve. He's got one more year in the contract. Obviously, one of the great coaches in the league. But uh, there were a lot of young players, and they struggled to develop them this year. Look, I love Steve Kerr. Okay, uh, if I was running a team and he were available, he'd be one of the first guys I call. Like his vision for what he wanted this group to be. The front office knew they needed to take it to another level. I mean, he's delivered. And I think the most important thing too is because of him being with the Spurs in the past and playing with guys like Jordan, like understanding, understanding just the emotional side of being one of these players. You know, like it was one of my favorite things about Doc Rivers in Boston. And I know nobody likes Doc now because he has all the three one series lead blown and all that stuff. And I get it. But what Doc was as good as anyone I've ever seen at is 
just managing the people, managing the six month stretch, you know, just making sure throughout all the turmoil and disagreements that everybody's, you know, still kind of on the same page as much as you can be. Right. And I think that might be the most important thing for a basketball coach or, you know, any, any of these coaches really in pro sports. So that part I love. And I also think that a coach's job to go out and try to win another title is like diametrically opposed to what a front office's job is and being like, Hey, we've spent all these resources on these picks. We got to see these guys out there. And clearly there were just nights where Steve didn't trust Wiseman. Um, you know, Kaminga's had his stretches where you're, you go like, Oh, there it is. Like these little, these little glimpses of what you think he could potentially be. And then you see the other times you're like, what is he doing? And so the coach in that moment, when he's got like Steph, Clay, Wiggins, and Draymond, I get his point. Like I can understand if the front office were ever frustrated. I don't know that. But, like if they were ever frustrated, being like, you got to get these guys some more minutes. And then him being like, I can't trust them. We are not a rebuilding team. So it's always fun in theory to think like, can we be one of the few franchises that competes for championships and rebuilds on the fly and restocks it with all these young lottery picks? It's really, really hard because the coach deep down is like, we're, that's not who we are. And so I understand the criticism. I can even understand the frustration, but I completely understand where Kerr is coming from. And it's kind of hard to tell him that he's doing it wrong. Especially after four championships and uh, all the finals appearances that they've made. Ryan Rossillo, you're a hit on our text line. People are clamoring for listener life advice uh, <laughs> from you. So maybe next time we have you on and we just talk about people and we talk about life, Ryan. We've already taken up that so much like, of your time. That sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I appreciate the invite. No, I appreciate you coming on. And, uh, man, great information here. Enjoy free agency. And we look forward to talking to you again, Ryan. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ryan. Ryan Rossillo, fantastic.